Christmas carol that says, prepare him room, and um, that's my job, is to help you and I together collectively prepare room for Christ this Christmas. And that's what Advent is all about. We're anticipating the second coming of Christ. And that word Advent, I love the way Elliot explained it, it's just the word in Latin means coming. And so we're celebrating and preparing for the coming of Christ. And so in order to prepare, I started preparing yesterday, where I started hanging lights on my house. And uh, I just, I like lights, and so not the tutti fruity ones, but the white ones, and not the LED ones, but the ones that give the yellow glow, you know, those are more holy than any other lights, <clears throat> so those are the ones I hung in my house, um, but I, I got started yesterday, and so, um, you know, when you plug in the lights, you find out which ones don't work from last year, yeah, that builds hope like no other, um, we'll be going to Home Depot or Target today to go finish that out, but your Christmas prep. There's prep for Christmas, right? But a lot of our prep has to do with really non-critical things. And so what I want to start today in this Advent season is how do we prepare our hearts? And the candle that we light today is the hope candle. And so here's what I'd like for you and I to do in the next maybe 30 minutes. Let's prepare our hearts by asking this question. How hopeful are you? So let's do it this way. In your notes right there, I created a little journal picture for you. So I want you to do this. Would you write down what you hope God will do for you, or what you hope God will bring you this Christmas. I know it might sound a little silly. It feels like a Christmas list, right? Like, we're not kids. We don't need a Christmas list. But yeah, you do, because everybody needs hope. What do you hope God will do for you, or what do you hope God will bring you this year? I just want you to write this down. I, I know that some of you are really noble people, and you write like, world peace. God bless you all. We need more of you, okay? Because that wouldn't be top of my list, all right? Or maybe you'll write something really noble like, you know, the end of starvation around the world, cure this disease. God, I hope you would give me that this Christmas. But if some of you are like me, um, you think about like your own personal world. And that's what I want you to do. Like a kid who, who I would ask, hey, what do you hope for this Christmas? They don't think about like world peace. They think about their world and, and what, what they want. For Christmas. Would you be just like that? I mean, after all, Jesus said, hey, let the little kids come to me. And he told his disciples, hey, have faith like a child. You got to believe just like a kid. If not, you just have no part in my kingdom. So let's all have kind of childlike faith in this moment. Ready? Write something down that you want God to do for you or to bring for you this Christmas. A vacation? Nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, write it down. No one's gonna, you're not going to have to share with your neighbor. I know some of you are like afraid you're going to pass it to your neighbor and like horrified at how selfish you are. Don't worry. Only you're going to see your selfishness, okay? <laughs> write it down. Uh, maybe your gift is you want your marriage restored. Maybe you would like a relationship with a friend. Maybe it's a new significant relationship that you're looking for this next year. Maybe you want a new car. Nothing wrong with that, right? Okay, if you're driving like a year-old car and you still want a new car, maybe there is a problem with that. Maybe you have a 20-year-old car and it's not working. You're taking the bus two hours one way to work, and you have kids at home and you can spend time with them. Maybe that's not such a selfish request. Um, 
Do you have something written down? Because the rest of this isn't really helpful unless you're personally invested in, I'm hoping for this this year. And maybe it's something you're hoping for somebody else, but it would really be a blessing to you. Like, hey, I have this neighbor who doesn't yet know Christ, and my prayer is that they would come to know Christ. I, I pray that God would do that. That's my hope this Christmas, is that my family or my friends or my neighbor would come to know Christ this year. And that you'd be, that would be a great gift for you. Awesome. I hope you have something written down there. I want to start this morning with an honest confession that I really, really want to be more hopeful but I'm not. Because I, I might be like some of you. And we, we sing songs of hope. You're kind of like lottery ticket hope, not biblical hope. You know what I mean by that? Hey, I hope these are the winning numbers. What size hope is that? Really, really small? See, biblical hope is different. Biblical hope, it actually says in the scriptures that it, hope is like an anchor for our soul. I mean, how, how tangible is an anchor? I mean, it's solid. It holds a ship. It's something that you can count on. But there's moments where, to just be really honest with you guys, I, I think my hope fades. I've been reading about the Christmas story. The Christmas story is full of hope. I've been preparing for these message, series of messages on, on rekindling hope. I've been preparing these for over a month now. And... Um, at the same time, I'm watching the news, and two weeks ago, you know, I read this story unfolding in Paris, where people are being slaughtered, and I'm sorry, my hope's not rising. I, I don't have a tremendous hope right now for our world. I watch the circus act that we call a presidential race, and I'm sorry, I, I just don't have much hope for our, our country. By the way, my hope has never been in politics, <laughs> and it's certainly not now. I look at the news and watch conflicts between race and Black Lives Matter and police law enforcement over here, and I'm just discouraged all the way across the board with both sides. Some great people on both sides. I just think, God, are we ever going to get this right? Probably not. I was in this room for a memorial service for a CHP officer just 10 days or so ago who gave up hope and he took his own life and leaves behind two kids and a wife and I feel my hope fade. If it's a candle, the, the flame is flickering. It's not totally snuffed out with the smoke circles kind of going up because I, I still have hope. But if I'm really honest and I read the Christmas story about hope, there's moments where I just wonder, God, what is it that you actually want me to be hopeful for? A friend of mine who knew that officer really, really well, he called me before the service. And we were talking. I haven't talked to him in quite a while. He was, he was just telling me, because I'm just stunned. Like, I had no idea. And I remember telling him, I said, you know, I think the truth is, is that we're probably all a little more hurting on the inside than we would ever care to admit. I still believe that's true. I think what we admit to each other, we're probably hurting a little more than we ever w would care to admit with our family and friends. Um, what about you? How's your hope? I mean, when you look at your hope list, is it lottery hope or is it biblical hope that has this confidence and this reassurance that, yes, these things on my list, they will happen? I think it probably depends on what you wrote down there. Probably depends on where you're at with God and how much you watch the news or don't watch the news. If you had to put a number on your hope, what would it be? Ten being unbelievable hope and one being like, mm, I barely have any hope at all. Where are you at today? Because I just think if we, when we come to church, if we're just blowing sunshine about joy to the world, but that doesn't come from within us, that's just something that comes through our vocal cords, I just want to be very real with each other that if we are living without hope, then let's just say it. And I'm not living without hope. I just have moments of discouragement and I... I guess that you're probably like me, maybe just a little bit. Are you more hopeful this year than last year? Well, how do you know? Let me ask you a couple questions or maybe make a couple statements here. If you're more temperamental this year, if you're more anxious this year, more frustrated, you have a shorter fuse this year than last year, you might have less hope. 
If you're drinking more booze this year than last year, you're probably living with a little less hope than last year. Because that's what a lot of people do when they don't have hope. If you like your family less this year than you did last year, (laughs) you, you might be lacking a little bit of hope. If your family likes you less this year than they did last year, you you might just have a little less hope than you did last year. If you're planning on moving to the mountains because you just don't like people anymore, you might have a little less hope this year. If, um, If maybe your Christmas gift to yourself is a new alarm system for the house, I'm just saying that might be a sign or a symptom that you have a little less hope this year. Um... Here's the truth. I want to have more hope. I want to be a pastor that hope lives inside me, and I I lead a church that hope lives inside every single follower of Christ at a 10 level. But I know the truth and the reality is this, is that hope, hope can fade. There's moments where it dims. And by the way, I don't mean to start this message in the Christmas season with such a Debbie Downer, right? But I just want to be real about this, that I have moments where I look at my world around me and I go, God, really? What what, what do you want me to be hopeful about? And it brings me back to the scriptures because as I was reading the Christmas story, I was reminded that Jesus, when he was born, the Christmas story, Jesus was born into a world that didn't have a lot of hope. God, for hundreds of years, had been silent with his people. No words of prophecy, no great victories. The, the, the place where Mary and Joseph live was under Roman rule. They weren't even allowed to govern themselves. There was no great financial stability for Joseph. Jesus was born in a cave. The political climate was hopeless. The, when Herod ruled over that area... If anybody rose up like to threaten his authority or like they might be a powerful person rising up, he would go after them and kill them. That's why when the wise men came to say, hey, where's this baby who's born king of the Jews? Herod's ears perked up and like, king of the Jews? Competition? And he has all the babies two years and under killed around Bethlehem? Jesus' parents... They hear about this and they flee. An angel tells them to flee to Egypt. And when Herod dies, they tell Mary and Joseph to bring Jesus back, but they're afraid of Herod's son now, who's just as mad an oppressor as his dad. And so they go to Nazareth, a place off the beaten path, not as much political conflict there. And they raise Jesus. Jesus was born into chaos and conflict. Maybe even more so than our world today. And so it reminds me that the Christmas story is set in the context of a hopeless place. And so I started reading the Christmas story with new eyes. And and I I read the story of Jesus' birth in the book of Matthew. Then I jumped over to Luke and read the Christmas story there. And and then I went to the book of Mark. And there's no Christmas story. They're just kind of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And those three books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are what's called the synoptic gospels. You know what that means, synoptic? Sin meaning same, optic meaning view, the same view. All three of these men wrote from the same view. But then there's John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is not a part of the synoptic gospels. You kind of wonder when you start reading the book of John, what was he thinking about? John starts with the Christmas story but it's a non-traditional Christmas story. And that's where I want us to start in taking a look at hope. So why don't you open there? Let's go John chapter one. I'm gonna read to you this Christmas story. As he begins it, there is no mom and dad, Mary and Joseph riding on a donkey to Bethlehem, okay? There's, There's none of that. There's this theological understanding because he doesn't start with 2,000 years ago. You know where John starts? John starts way before 2,000 years ago. As far as you could possibly see back in any kind of history, you're you're not even close as to when John starts his story. Because here's how John chapter 1 starts. In the beginning, that's kind of a long time ago, wouldn't you say? (laughs) Before the time ever existed, before the planet ever existed, there was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's something happening where this Godhead 
has a relationship and there is this thing called the Word and there's God the Father and there's a spirit that hovers over the waters if you read Genesis chapter 1. And then it says this, he was with God in the beginning and you start to learn that the Word was not a what but a who. He was with God in the very, very beginning and through him all things were made and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And I got to verse 5 and it stopped me in my tracks. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John's version is a little different. Starts from way long ago. But when I read that verse, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. What it's trying to say is this, is that Jesus came and Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I mean, John's gospel talks about life and light more than any other gospel. He's saying Jesus came into the world to shed light on this is who God is, this is who who humanity is, and this is how God and humanity are going to be reconciled and brought into relationship. The light came into the darkness. Now, darkness in this case isn't like our sinful habits. When he says that light came into this dark world, he's talking about evil. Came into a world that was possessed and run by evil. And yet evil, darkness, has not overcome Jesus. Now, that word overcome is interesting because it means this. It means to grab onto, to grasp. And some people have said this. Yes, darkness was in the world, light came into the world, and and darkness has not been able to understand it, meaning mentally grasp it. Some of your versions of Scripture might read that way. Most commentators would say this, that that, yes, that's probably true. Darkness didn't understand God's plan. God fooled them all along the way. You thought that you were getting rid of my son, and yet, and winning the war by nailing him to a tree and killing him on the cross like it was over, and God's like, mm, you didn't get it, darkness. You didn't understand it. Yes, that's true, but that's not exactly what this concept means. Because it, it's one thing to say, well, the ar- darkness didn't understand it. It still leaves me wondering, well, how powerful is darkness in our world and how powerful is God? Ah, he fooled them. I don't think that's what this is saying. What this is saying is that darkness could not grab the light of God and kill it, destroy it, or extinguish it. And that's where my hope started getting restored. That Jesus came into our world to describe, to shed light on, and Satan, his angels, evil, could not extinguish, could not conquer, could not kill. And it reminds me when Jesus was with Peter and he says, hey, who do people say that I am? And they went through a long list of people and Jesus says, but Peter, who do you say that I am? And he says this, he says, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus tells him, you are not smart enough that you came up with that on your own. He said, my father, he just revealed that to you. God gave Peter that answer. And then he says this, And I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock, the truth that you just stated, that I'm the Messiah, that I'm the Christ, on that rock, I'm going to build my church. Who's going to build the church? Jesus is going to build the church. Peter's going to do an awful lot of work for it, but make no mistake, Jesus builds his church. And the gates of Hades will not, here it is, overcome it. For the last 2,000 years, particularly for the first 300 years of the church, were marked with bloodshed martyrdom, and persecution. But evil didn't win. The Christian life isn't necessarily the easy life. It can be really hard, but darkness has not overcome it. 2,000 years later, you and I are sitting in a massive auditorium singing songs about this Savior that has come and preparing our hearts to see hope rise and say, say, God, would you bring us more hope? And the truth is this. This is evidence that Evil has not overcome. Darkness has not overcome. There is no greater force or power in our world than Jesus Christ, and there's nothing in Paris that took him by surprise. There's nothing in our race conflicts that takes him by surprise. What our race conflict needs is to understand how God loves and respects different races of people and has forgiveness and grace for everyone. 
Our world desperately needs that kind of God. And my hope actually started rising as I started reading this. So question, are there things that you and I can do to rekindle our hope? Is there anything that you can do to say, I'd like my hope to rise, but I think it's all up to God. Wait, wait, wait. Is it up to you to some degree? Is there something that you and I can do? And I think there is. And here's the first thing. I I find it in this text. In John chapter 1, and I'll just state it to you right up front. The first thing we need to do is remember the power of Jesus. And what I mean by that is this, is when we focus on the news and what is going on around us in our chaotic world, all of a sudden our problems get this big. And if we are not being reminded constantly that Christ, the baby that was born, was not just flesh and blood. It was God born into our world, not just a God, the eternal God who breathed life into the world. Listen to how he's described. In the beginning was the world, was the word. Jesus then was eternal. In the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is God with flesh on. Without him, nothing was made. He's the creator of all things. And in him was life, which means he put life into plants, he put life into animals, and he personally breathed life into the nostrils of man and brought life into the world. I think he's also the source of our spiritual life. That if we need hope and we're feeling hopeless, where else are we going to go? The light shines in the darkness that when the world was hopeless, Jesus stepped in. He's like, I ain't putting up with darkness anymore. And the light pushes back the darkness. And then it says the darkness has not overcome it. Therefore, Jesus is undefeated. And he made his dwelling among us. And maybe that's one of the greatest things about recognizing Jesus' power, remembering it, is that his name was also Emmanuel, that he's with us. The God from way back when, before this planet that we're so impressed by, was ever made, he was. And today he is. And today he's with us. The same power that brought life to the world is present today. I I don't even know how to wrap my mind around that. And some of you might go, well, didn't Jesus go and ascend into heaven? Well, yeah, the scripture says that Jesus is at the right hand of God. But he said, I'm going to send you a helper. God's presence with you, the Holy Spirit that will live inside you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. What do I have to be hopeless about? You see, I gotta get, I gotta reorient my mind to think, who is the God that lives in me? And then what do I have to fear? Jesus would make statements like, you should fear those not that can kill the body, but those that can kill the soul. Not to be afraid of life or death, and I I think that's what terrorism is about, right? To cause fear and apprehension in people. The first thing we do is just remember that he is all-powerful, almighty God. But the second thing is this. We need to remember that he cares for us. I know it might seem like something that is so elementary in its nature. To think, oh, well, God's powerful and that he also cares for us. But let me explain it this way. When I start going through the book of John, and I start flipping through the pages about what Jesus cares for, I start seeing what God cares for. Let, let me prove it to you. Page... Um, I'm sorry, John chapter 1, verse 18. John states this about Jesus. He says, no one's ever seen God, but the one and the only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. What Jesus cares about, he's revealing what God cares about. Uh, Who Jesus talks to is the kind of person that God would talk to. The way in which Jesus speaks to people, that's how God speaks to people. What Jesus eats for lunch, okay, well, maybe that doesn't apply. But Jesus is revealing God to us. So here's what I do. I I turn and I I go to John chapter 2. And in John chapter 2, Jesus brought hope to a couple who ran out of wine at their wedding. 
just my opinion, the most insignificant miracle in all of the scriptures. Don't strike me dead, Lord, sorry. But what's at stake here? Social embarrassment? What's at stake if Jesus doesn't turn water to wine? Uh, awkwardness, I mean, they'd be made fun of. Maybe. But really, that's it. And yet Jesus cares about it enough to do his first miracle. Look on your hope list, what you wrote down. Is it at least mildly more important than turning water to wine at a wedding? My guess is probably so. If not, you might want to rethink your list. <laughs> but if that's what Jesus cared about, that's what God cares about. So I turn to John chapter 3, and there's this religious guy named Nicodemus who's genuinely searching for God, and Jesus reveals to him who he was. God cares about religious people. In John chapter 4, there's this woman who's trying to find her identity in all the men she's known throughout her life. And she's a Samaritan where Jesus as a Jew shouldn't even been talking to her, but God cares about her who's had a pretty rough road and made some pretty difficult and raunchy choices in her life. Cares enough to lead her to salvation. And it's interesting, not only that, but it says that there's an entire city that came to faith because of her. Jesus will t stop for somebody that most people will never stop for, and that reveals what God cares about and who God cares about. In the same chapter, John chapter 4, there's a father whose son is deathly ill, and God, Jesus brings him hope. Jesus brought hope to a man who'd been laying on the ground for 38 years because he couldn't walk. Jesus brought hope to 5,000 plus people who just wanted to hear him speak and teach. They were curious about who he was and what his philosophy on life was. At the end of the day, they were hungry. Jesus is like, let's feed them. <laughs> he cares about that kind of thing. In John chapter 9, Jesus brought hope to a man who was blind, and so he healed him. But this is interesting. He goes, I, I didn't just do this miracle, loose translation here. I didn't just do this miracle so a blind guy could see. That's great. I want you to understand this. He's not the only blind guy in the room. He sees, but the truth is, all of y'all are spiritually blind because you don't know who I am. He does that whole miracle so he can say, what's harder to do? Help a blind guy see or all you spiritually blind people for me to remove the blinders so that you can see that I'm the son of God? Maybe on your list is somebody who doesn't yet know who Christ is. And I will tell you this, you might feel hopeless but nobody is beyond the reach of God. In John 11, Jesus brought hope to two sisters who just buried their brother by bringing him back to life. Hey, Christmas, it can be the most magical time of the year, and I use that term loosely, okay? The most spiritual time of the year, but can also be one of the hardest times of the year for people who've lost loved ones. And I don't think Jesus is gonna come back and like raise your loved one back from the dead, I think there's a time where Jesus will bring all of his people, those who are his, his, Christians, his followers, and bring them all and unite them all together in heaven in his presence. And that's my hope that I'll see my loved ones again. But I know this, that the same way he comforted Mary and Martha, Jesus was there with them in the midst of that death. It says that he wept with them. I know that Christmas can be a powerful time where God meets people in their sorrow. And I'll get to this by the end, that there's a way to grieve without hope, and there's a way to grieve with hope. So even if you're grieving this Christmas, I'm going to tell you there's a way to grieve with hope, and we'll get to that in just a moment. First two things, if we're going to rekindle hope, we have to remember the power of Jesus, and it's right there in the Christmas story according to John. Second, we've got to recognize that Jesus cares for us. And it's right there throughout the entire writings of John. And here's the third thing, and I know this is going to sound so elementary, but if we did it all the time, we'd be, have more hope. Read the scriptures. If we just read this, our hope would go up. Here, here's what the scripture says about itself. Romans 15, 4, for everything was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement that they provide, we might have hope. So can we do this? This Christmas, let's do something together. Let's all read the scriptures together, okay? Here's what I want you to do. Pull out your digital device. Got your phone, tablet, something on you right now? Pull it out. 
Um, maybe you have the YouVersion app. Maybe you don't. Uh, pull it up right now. And if you want to download the YouVersion app, go ahead and do it. There's your little icon. You'll find it in the, uh, the app store of whatever device you use. You always got to be trying to like politically correct. I can't say pull out your iPhone, right? Once you pull that up, you'll open uh, YouVersion. Take a look inside. Um, right down in the lower left-hand corner, or probably near the bottom, you'll find this um, reading plan. And I just circled it in red down there. You'll click on that. And that'll open up to these reading plans that are all in there. And they're based on days. And if you hit on the right there, discover, it'll come up this list of all these reading plans that people have already put together. Click on Christmas and Advent. And it takes you to this long list of reading plans. And they start out with like three days, four days, five days. Well, if you scroll down, you'll get to this 25-day plan called Rediscovering the Christmas Season. And you'll click on that, and it opens up to a reading plan. And in there, you'll see every day, you'll click on today's reading, and it'll show you a text. You're going to read that text that day. And then you'll also click on this devotional content, and there's content in there that somebody has written out to encourage you, to help your hope rise. So here's what I'd like to do. I want you to download this today. I want you to start reading this today. So you and I, together, every day until Christmas Eve, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put our faces in the scriptures. How long do you take flipping through Yahoo News or whatever it is you flip through to get your news or entertainment or infotainment, whatever it is? At least spend that kind of time in in the scriptures. And this won't even take you long, but let's collectively do this. And would you do this as well? Would you gather together with your family? And if you're like, ah, I go to church by myself, my family doesn't go to church, would you gather together with one or two other friends, either on the phone or, or in person. In person could even be better. But if your family are believers and you live with them, I want you to do this once a week. I want you to gather together and just share. This is what stuck with me this week as to what I read. There's an accountability in that. Not only that, but when you start hearing what stuck with people, you start sharing life together. By the way, if you want your family relationships to go deep, you're kind of dissatisfied with the shallowness of your marriage or your, your relationship with your kids, your relationship with your parents. Try doing this together and see what people start sharing. So let's put our faces in the scriptures together. You okay? I'm asking for a commitment on this one, all right? I hope I'm not by myself. Here's the fourth thing. I would love it if you and I would recite prayers of hope. Paul writes to this church in Rome I mean, the core, the hub of the governmental power that's oppressing the church. He writes to that church, if if you would, in the belly of the beast. He writes to that church, and he writes this prayer, and he says, May the God of hope, the God who is hope, the God is full of hope, may he fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope. You remember how you felt Thursday? After you gorged yourself with turkey, I I felt overflowing in all kinds of terrible ways. (laughs) Overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's something in this. You know that hope is spiritual. It, It is a spiritual act of God that when we pray for it and ask for it, that if he does that, he can make us overflow with hope. We not... So when you overflow with hope, you not only have enough hope for you, you have enough hope for the next guy. And when you rub shoulders, whatever's overflowing out of you, oh, it's going to get all over them. That when you rub shoulders, bump into people, even at the mall, there's going to be an overflowing of hope. And so here's what I'd love for us to do. Would you just recite prayers of hope? Maybe you just take this and write this down somewhere. Maybe you put it on your you know, your, your desktop, your, your screensaver, whatever that is, your mobile device, or maybe, I don't know, write it out, paste it on your mirror at home, whatever it is, but even commit this to memory. And for those of you, I just know that there's some people in here that you're struggling with hope this time of year. You're like, yeah, if I believed in hope, I'd have a job by now. If I believed in hope, I'd, I'd, I'd have a relationship by now. If I, if I really had a hope of God, my kids would be different. And I know some of you are struggling. Can I just tell you this? In the moment where you feel hopeless, I want you to say this out loud. And let it just be your prayer. May the God of hope fill me with all joy and peace as I trust in him. 
so that I may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And just pray that for you. It's just a crying out to God because I believe in his power and because I believe in his care. I can pray something like this and trust that he'll respond. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to be reminded of his power, reminded of his care. We're going to read the scriptures together, recite these prayers, and here's the last thing. When Jesus came into the world, he said, I'm the light of the world. He says, you're not going to have me for long, and he makes this statement. Believe in the light while you have the light. Believe in me while I'm with you, so that you may become children of light. When he's saying this, when I go, now it's your job to be the hope of the world. He even made this statement to his disciples. He says, you are the light of the world. So here's the last thing. You want to see your own hope increase? Here's what I want you to do. Be hopeful for the other people living around you. I want you to be the most hopeful person in the boardroom. I want you to be the most hopeful person in cubicle world. I want you to be the most hopeful person in the classroom. This might be the hardest one of all, ready? I want you to be the most hopeful person that lives under your roof. Because we're most authentic with the people that know us the most, right? We also treat the worst, (laughs) those that know us the most. We're not afraid to be hopeless there. But would you be hopeful with your own family? If we do this, here's why I'm bringing all this up. On December 24th, Christmas Eve, we will gather together and have a celebration of hope. And I just wonder if every heart will prepare God room so that hope can live in them, that when we gather together to have a celebration of hope and we start coming together to sing that it's an explosion of hope. That when our friends and our family that we invite together to come and and gather maybe at the noon service or the sick service, that they're struck by how much hope is in the room. When they walk in, they go, these people are different. That pastor, he's different. He's a person of hope. And so, hey, you better be praying for me. I got 25 days, right, to have the hope of Christ in me. And I do, but, you know, come on, I get discouraged sometimes, don't you? I want to rekindle my own hope, and I hope you want to rekindle yours so that when we gather together, it's a genuine celebration of Christ. Because there's a lot to be hopeful for. The scripture says this, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. You know, when people are really struggling, they doubt one of two things. Either that God is powerful enough to change their circumstances, or that sometimes they don't doubt his power. I know God is almighty God, but what they doubt is that whether God really cares for them. And he says this, cast all your anxiety, not some of it, not the biggest stuff, not the smallest stuff, all of it, because God cares for you. And then we get to this. What specifically are you hoping for? It might be on your list, but we're not just hoping for the here and the now. I hope there's something on your list that is of eternal value. Let me read to you this. Jesus said this, don't let your hearts be troubled. He's talking to his disciples because he just told them, I'm going away. I'm going to die. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. My first and foremost primary hope in this Jesus that came to earth to reveal God to us is that he came to save me. And my hope is not for this life alone. My hope is actually for heaven. It's interesting because Paul writes this about if the resurrection's not really true, he writes, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, if only for the here and the now, if only for the the list of, of, hey, would God do this for me this Christmas? If that's all we're hoping for, here's what he says. We are of all people most to be pitied. If the things that drive us aren't eternal, then reevaluate your list. My primary hope is in my salvation and the salvation of my family and my friends and the people that I come into contact with. That's our primary hope. And that is not a lottery ticket hope. 
That is an anchor hope that anchors my soul to the resurrection of Christ. And for those of you that this Christmas you will grieve, there's a way to grieve with hope and without hope. Let me read it to you. Paul is writing about those who've already died. He says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who've fallen asleep in death so that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. You ever been to a funeral service? And you either don't know if the person was a believer or you clearly know they weren't? It's a room without hope. It's a room where there's a bunch of people spewing forth platitudes to one another to try and make themselves feel better. And I cringe inside at that. Because what Paul is saying, that's what it means to grieve without hope. We start making stuff up to help ourselves feel better. But then he says this. This is our reason for hope. We believe that Jesus died and then rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have already died. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Here's this coming that we are anticipating. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Is that your hope? Not your lottery ticket hope, but your anchor hope. That your eternity is set with God. No matter what is going on in the world around you, as flimsy as life can feel, there is a hope that your eternity is secure. If you don't have that, grab it today. It's not something you just grab and shove in your pocket and walk out. It is a life dedicated to following Christ. It's believing that he died for you and that the resurrection really happened. That's why nobody could find his body. That when he died on that cross, he died for your sins. The only thing you can do to get it is put your hands out and say, Jesus, would you save me? Jesus, my life is broken without you. Would you cover my sin and let me join your family so I can follow you? If you don't have that kind of hope, you're missing Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. But let me make this really clear. Go back to your list. What did you write? You might have written something eternal. This Christmas, maybe there's someone that you know that doesn't know Christ that you want them to meet Christ. That's great. But there's some other things on your list, I guarantee, that aren't about the life to come, but they're right here. Don't start shaking your head at those things. Look at how Jesus interacted with people. He cared about those things. He cares about your marriage. He cares about your parenting. He cares about how you try to find your identity in other people or other things. He cares about those. So take all your anxieties, cast them on Christ this Christmas because he cares for you. Do you know him? If you don't, fix your eyes on him and let's you and I take active steps to rekindle our hope, not just for eternity, but for the life here and now because this is what the scripture says. When Jesus came, he was Emmanuel, God with us. Church, he's with us. He's with us. The God who loves us and is all powerful and eternal, he's with us. I hope that brings hope back to you. And slowly but surely in these next 25 days, that you and I collectively, our hope starts rising. Are you up for that? Let's pray.